Well, praise the Lord, we're back again. And so we're maybe talking a little more from the heart this time. <clears throat> so I would like to turn to John chapter 12 and read verses 20 to, through 26. John 12, 20 through 26. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who keep sorry, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. <clears throat> so these Greeks came, <coughs> excuse me. These Greeks came to Jesus and they, or to Philip, <clears throat> and they said, Sir, we would see Jesus. Now that seems like a, an incredibly worthy request. We want to see Jesus. In fact, I've seen this engraved on the fronts of pulpits. We would see Jesus. And I've always, for many years, I was, I was bewildered by Jesus' response to that. Why didn't he say, wow, this is what I've been waiting on? I mean, tell him to come, you know? His, his answer seems strange. But as I meditated on this and prayed over it, here's what came to me. Jesus said, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, well, okay, I'm going to skip down to verse 26. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. It would seem to me that these Greeks may have had wrong motives. I can just picture these people maybe hearing about Jesus and his miracles and they bumped into Philip and, and they said, hey, that would be great. We're having a cookout tonight and we'd love to see this guy. Maybe he could do a couple miracles. We'd love to see that. Tell him to come on over. Jesus is not here to just come into our party <clears throat> and entertain us. That's not what he came for. If you want to see Jesus, you have to go where he is. And it's all about his program. <clears throat> and it's not about using him for my program. And honestly, there's way too much professed Christianity out there where they're trying to use Jesus to, to bless somebody else's program, and you can't do that. It's his program, and we need to get <clears throat> on board with his program. So let's back up to verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain or much fruit. So there's a principle in kingdom work. We must fall into the ground and die. What does that mean? This is a principle. It's a metaphorical picture of a spiritual truth. What is it? What does it mean to fall into the ground and die? Is it a full surrender? I'm sure it is. I'm sure it includes that. But it goes beyond just simply a full surrender. It's the death of one's will, fleshly desires, and ego. Literally something has to die. It's being liberated, set free from the power of the flesh. And this is a spiritual process that, that has to happen in order for, for us to bear much fruit. 
If we go through this, what's the result? Much fruit. Resurrection life. Clendenin used to say, there's nothing going to go to heaven that didn't come from heaven. There has to be a resurrection life take place. Uh, it has to flow out of us. This includes a change of allegiance, but it's more. It's a spiritual change, transformation. It's a change in our source of power. Jesus talked about the grape. <clears throat> He's the vine and we're the branches. And, and he talks about abiding in him, being grafted in, being planted in him. Formerly, before we were believers, we were planted in the old Adamic Nature, Adam was our source of life, and we as the human race were all plugged into that family tree, right? And then in uh, Romans it says we were grafted into Christ. He becomes our source of life and power. This process turns a person into a channel through which the resurrection power of Christ can flow. T. Austin Sparks said, in God's economy, only resurrection life is of any value. Only resurrection life is of any value. That's a hard lesson for us to learn. But folks, that's how it is. Only resurrection life is of any value in God's economy. The principle of the seed is further expounded in 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 18. I'm going to turn to that. 2 Corinthians 4, starting in verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bond servants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not, excuse me, at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So, <clears throat> I'm going to start there in verse 6. It is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. So I would see this as a reference to the creation of the world. In the beginning there was nothing but darkness, and God said, let there be light. This God has shown in our hearts 
to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now that's a mouthful there. We could talk all week on, on that verse, on that phrase there, but what is the glory of God? So at one point, one of our Tatomata brothers, he said, I, I hear people saying glory to God. He says, what does that mean, glory? And I said, well, that means, that means, and all of a sudden I realized I didn't know what glory meant. And I spent the next two years studying the word glory. And I looked in the Strong's Concordance, and it just simply means glory. And I, that didn't really get me very far. And so I started going through the, the New Testament and looking at how that word is used to find some clue of what it means. And I'll give you a brief summary of what I came up with. And if, if the Lord gave you something beyond that, I'd be interested in hearing it. But the glory of God, it's a light that shines out of God. It radiates, it emanates out of God. And in that glory, in that light that shines out are all of the attributes of God. God's essence and his very nature flow out of him as a light. It says he dwells in, in an unapproachable light. And that light shines out of God. And that's the glory of God. Included in that are his love and his anger, his honor, his dignity, his mercy and his love. Um, everything that God is shines out of, of himself. It is the uh, who shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Wow. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side. <clears throat> Honestly, if we're going to go do church planting in unreached areas, this is what we're going to have. We're going to be hard pressed on every side. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. We're hit hard, but we don't have to burn out. We run up against a brick wall, but we get back up and go on. The righteous falls seven times and gets back up. We're not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. Yes, it's true. We go through stress. We go through disappointment, we go through betrayal, we go through difficulties, but that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. We become a living example. The life of Christ flows through us. And, and what impacts the people around us, what impacts the world is so much more than the words we say. It's that life that just flows out of us. As Paul says, we are the aroma of Christ. Verse 11, for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Here we go. <clears throat> Here's a quote. Church planting among the unreached is difficult. Missionaries will have to go through long seasons of high stress living. Quote by Wayne Chen. Missionary planting among the unreached is difficult. Missionaries will have to go through long seasons of high stress living. Is this what you signed up for? Did anyone tell you that you'd be doing this? Plant, church planting among the unreached <clears throat> is the equivalent of standing on an anthill and shooting into a hornet's nest with a slingshot. It's just how it is. Is that what you signed up for? It's spiritual warfare. The devil's not gonna be happy with you. <clears throat> and there's gonna be a death that's gonna take place within you. But that's not the end of the story. There's also a resurrection life that can flow out. We talk about dying and we all say, yes, we want to do that. 
But we want to die with one eye open, right? It's how we are. <clears throat> it's a continual process. This is not a one-time thing. Jesus said we should take up our cross daily and follow him. Yes, there, is, there are crisis moments, but it's a daily process of this death happening and then that resurrection life flowing out of us. And this is how God has used his servants down through the ages. And we all love to get these biographies and read about the wonderful things that has happened <clears throat> throughout history. And we love to read about souls being saved and miracles happening and lives being transformed and churches planted and movements starting. We love that. But so many times we skip over or somehow we don't get this thing of this death and resurrection. But that's the principle that always underlies all the successful stories that you're going to read. And, and it's just going to be that way. There's no way around it. It's not like some of you are going to go through this. Every single person that's going to really be involved in Frontline's uh, mission work is going to go through this process. Now, some at different levels, some in different ways, but there's going to have to be a complete, absolute breaking of ourself and of our will if there's going to ever be resurrection power flowing out through us. <coughs> It is impossible to experience this process fully without trials. T. Austin Sparks said, spiritual revelation is always bound up with practical experience. You can't learn this in a school. You can't get this just in... You can <clears throat> serve yourself a cup of coffee and sit down in your favorite chair and read the Bible. You can feed yourself spiritually, but the death... Uh, the death process has to be, it's, it's bound up in personal experience. We have to go through trials. It, outward trials and inward struggles both uh, do a spiritual work in us. And as we go through trials, if we don't get bitter, we'll get better. I have a friend from India. He was visiting in my home, and I said, do you have a story for the children? And he said, yeah, I do. <clears throat> and so he talked about the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And he said, wouldn't we all love to have been those little fishes that Jesus multiplied that day to feed the 5,000? But he said, you know what? For those little fishes to go through that wonderful uh, privilege of feeding the 5,000, those fish had to be taken out of their comfort zone, out of the Sea of Galilee, gutted and fried. And then Jesus used them in feeding the 5,000. It's a pretty, pretty graphic story of what God's going to do in our lives. Galatians 6.14 but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So I want to talk a little bit about this cross. What is this cross that he talks about? The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, <clears throat> there was the altar of bronze, the altar of burnt offerings that was in front of the tabernacle. And God commanded Moses to sanctify the altar for seven days. And after the, that seven-day process, the altar was consecrated as a place to receive the offerings, the sacrifices. That altar had to be officially recognized. God officially recognized that as a place to receive those burnt offerings. The cross, in a, in a symbolic way, the cross of Christ has been sanctified, has been um, prepared as, as, a, as the instrument of death to deliver us from the old nature and from ourself and our pride and our ego and our old source of life. 
Somehow, the work that Jesus did in giving up of himself, of offering of himself, it was a lifelong process. The dying on the actual cross was the, 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 the culmination of all of that, but it was a lifelong process of taking up the cross. And that work that Jesus did opened up a way for us to also be delivered from our uh, flesh, our old source of life. So Jesus became the second Adam. In Christ, we can have a new source of life. And so Paul said, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul was excited about the cross because it delivered him. It set him free from all of that stuff that bound him previously. The cross is, a, is the way to resurrection life. So as we think of taking up the cross, if you think of dying, <clears throat> what, uh, I'd like to explain a little bit more about that. The, the application of the cross to our life is going to touch many facets of our life. First of all, it's gonna attach uh, touch the area of, of just simply a full surrender, just giving ourselves up to Christ. But I hope that all of us have come to that. I hope that every one of us has fully surrendered our life to Jesus, right? But as we go along, God keeps working on that and, and touching different facets of our life. Just simply our appetites for food and for comfort I remember a work that God did in me a number of years ago, actually quite a few years ago, probably 27 or 28 years ago. We used to have a fellowship meal at church every month. And I don't know, it seemed like there was a competition going on among the sisters to make the best food, right? And there was like two or three tables of some of the best food in the world on those tables. And every Sunday I would just load myself up until I could hardly walk. And one day God said, just because there's good food on those tables doesn't mean that you have to practice gluttony. You don't have to overeat. And God uh, started to work in my life. God convicted me of the need of fasting, of breaking the power of food in my life. Our emotions, our feelings. So many of us run on emotions and feelings. God will take us through situations to strip us of the, of the need to depend on emotions and feelings. <coughs> I want to mention <clears throat> a few verses here in the Bible about feelings. Job 23, 8 through 10. Look, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. This is in the Old Testament, but honestly, this is the experience of many of God's people. Some of the most outstanding of God's people have gone through times and seasons in their life where they don't feel God's presence. And, and then the devil comes in and, and just torments us with condemnation and says, you've backslid, you've done something wrong. You should always feel God's presence. Job did not always feel God's presence. Psalm 88, 13 and 14. But to you I have cried out, O Lord, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? David was having his morning devotions. He hadn't given up on that. He was still seeking after God. But he says, why do you hide your face from me? He went through times of spiritual dryness where he didn't feel God's presence. But he kept on. And God has to wean us from this thing of always feeling a spiritual rush. 
Some of God's servants have gone through years of dryness. You read John Bunyan's uh, biography and some of those, I mean, this man went through years of dryness. And out of that, incredible resurrection life and blessing came out of that. When the, when the uh, pioneers came over from the old country, a lot of them had two books in their library. They had the Bible and the Pilgrim's Progress. Why did they have that Pilgrim's Progress? That book has incredible spiritual blessing. It's written in kind of old English. Um, we have so many easier things to read nowadays, and we've kind of left the Pilgrim's Progress. But that book brought incredible blessing to many, many people. How did he get that? Through years of valleys and struggles. There was a death and a resurrection came out of John Bunyan. Psalm 89, 46. How long, Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? Will you hide yourself forever? Sometimes it feels like a long time. <clears throat> but it's part of the process, and God's doing something good. Don't let yourself be brought under condemnation. God has to take us through trials, and he has a purpose. All right, religious ideas. So many of us, myself included, I moved to Mexico in January of 1998. And guess what? I, I knew a lot. I knew how churches ought to be run. I knew how things ought to happen. And God began to strip away my ideas and show me that I didn't know as much as I thought I did. There's something called ethnocentrism. That's the idea that my ethnic background is better than everybody else's. We just know that the Mennonite way is better, right? We just know that the way I do things is better. Brother Harold said, you know, he was time conscious. And we just know that someone who gets there late is wrong. He's stealing everyone's time. And then God begins to work in our lives and show us, oh, there's more sides to this story, right? Our reputation. And church, if you haven't gone through this one, it's coming. You will have to give up your reputation. And the people who God has used the most have had to completely lay down their reputation and be willing to be looked at as a failure. Are you willing for that to happen? Psalm 22, verse 6. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised by the people. So personally, personally, I never went, how would I say? I grew up in a very sheltered environment. So, <clears throat> you know, I never did get into, um, you know, drinking and drugs and, and things like that. And when I moved to Mexico, the Lord took me through some experiences where I feel like I was able to identify with those kinds of people. I felt like a worm and no man, an outcast, a reproach of men and despised by the people. I don't know how other people saw me, but the Lord took me through a valley where I felt that. And after you go through that, you lose your reputation among the what does David say? I'm the song of the drunkards, right? But also the loss of reputation among your peers. God has to take us through those valleys. But it's not to hurt us. It's to bring us through to resurrection life. Praise God. So, <clears throat> after some of the experiences I went through, I told my wife, I said, I feel like I'm going through a sausage machine. I heard someone else say they felt like they went through a meat grinder. And I was thinking about the, the, the two fish that Jesus used. They went through the frying pan, right? But there's resurrection life on the other side. Let's not be discouraged. God is using us to become food for someone else, food for the hungry. And if we are willing to go through all of this, there will be a miracle. There will be resurrection life. God doesn't just... 
led us there. So <clears throat> some of you have perhaps read biographies. You've read stories of missionaries that have inspired you. You're learning missionary methods and all of this kind of stuff. <clears throat> in, in reading those stories, what sometimes doesn't uh, catch our eye is the, the cost or the, the way that God prepared those people, the process that God used. And we say, oh, I like his methods better than that person's methods. And we're copying so-and-so as a historical hero because I like his methods. Well, there's a lot of complex details that we don't know about. You know, God has taken some people into very difficult mission fields. I remember years ago reading the story of Victor Plymeyer. Victor Plymeyer went to a place called Tibet, and it was pr practically untouched at that time with the gospel, back in the 1800s, I guess. And he poured out his whole life for that place. I mean, he really poured out. His wife died in the middle of the winter, and the ground was frozen. He could hardly dig a grave to bury his wife. And all, I think there's maybe one person joined him for the funeral. Um, and he lived his whole life pouring himself out for those people. I think there might have been a small congregation was, was uh, planted, but he didn't see huge numbers. But God is preparing us for eternity. The things that we go through are a preparation for eternity. Let's go back there to 2 Corinthians 4. Verse 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more and exceeding far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. An eternal weight of glory. What does that mean? God is getting us ready for something beautiful in heaven. And the things that we go through are not wasted. You know, I've done a lot of things that feel like a waste. So I told you about going to a town for four years and then being dismissed. Um, I spent five years hiking from house to house in Wawavel and never made a convert. Every day hiking from house to house in those canyons. I'm not ashamed of that because God's doing a work in me. and He's getting me ready for eternity. I'm happy to pour my life out. But the, the question is, are we going to pour our lives out? That's the bigger question. Will we pour our lives out for him? <clears throat> Hebrews six seventeen through 20. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. God wants us to have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope, brothers and sisters, this hope we have both sure and steadfast and which enters the presence behind the veil. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. We can keep on because God is doing something beautiful. He's preparing us for eternity. This hope that is set before us is an anchor to keep us from burnout, from depression, from condemnation, from, <clears throat> from failure. So one of the things that I feel like God has been 
working in me, and I don't feel like I've learned this lesson completely. I'm, I'm working on this. But I just want to share something that I feel like God is, is working in my life. Hebrew, uh, Philippians 3, verse 10, <clears throat> that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. About 20 years ago, I had this intense desire to know him. And I spent <clears throat> a lot of time fasting and praying and seeking God's presence. And, um, <clears throat> and I had this, this strong desire to experience the power of his resurrection in ministry. And it also says the fellowship of his sufferings. This is something I don't know much about. Many of God's people in, in uh, <clears throat> places of severe persecution know much more about this. But there's, there's something that God wants to bring his people into, and that's the fellowship with Christ in suffering. One of the things that, that God allowed me to go through is to experience betrayal in some measure. And I feel like I understand more of Jesus, what he went through when he was betrayed. And, and um, let's not give up. When we go out to the mission field and we go through difficult situations and, and we feel discouraged and we don't feel God's presence and things don't seem to be prospering, let's not give up. We're fellowshipping with him and his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Did you sign up for long periods of high stress living? Did you sign up to go somewhere and die to self and maybe even die physically, I don't know. But I'm just being honest with you, that's what this is all about. But there's also something very, very glorious on the other side, and that's the resurrection life. If God flows through us and is going to make us a, part, a um, participant in, and in the end. It says that Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. I'm sure many of you know this, but Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, he received a glorified body, and he is the first and he has promised each one of us that we shall be like him. I am expecting by the grace of God to receive a body like Jesus has, a glorified body that is beyond corruption and sin and death. Let's learn to fellowship with him and let's uh, keep pressing on in faith. Our God is good. Let's not burn out. Let's not give up. Let's not get discouraged. And I, I just want to say to the ones who are um, supporting someone out on the front lines, um, you have no idea how, how important your job is. It's an incredibly important job to support someone who's on the front lines. Praise God. Let's keep pressing forward. Uh, could you tell us a little about some of the good things that you gave up in a pursuit of knowing God? Maybe some legitimate um, pleasures or things that you could have claimed your right to. I haven't given up anything worth talking about. <laughs> no, honestly, I, I really haven't. You know, Jesus told us to... <clears throat> Eat whatever's set before us. And I've, I've practiced that. I um, gave up my food in Pennsylvania, moved to Mexico, and I eat whatever's set before me down there. But honestly, it's good. It's not like uh, I've had to suffer. No, there's really nothing that I can say that I've really sacrificed. The, the, the difficult trials that God has taken me through are, are mostly inward. Really, there's, there's been few outward trials. I mean, there's been a few, but... Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you, do you have any more specific um, thoughts on what you on Just that? Just like in, in uh, giving yourself to prayer and fasting. Uh, as you gave yourself to prayer and fasting, or um, 
Yeah, maybe, um, I don't know if maybe you weren't even consciously aware of what you were giving up, but how did your daily routine change? Or um, I kind of want to know what are the practical um, effects of really digging into seeking God? Like, how did that change your daily life and routine and things? Well, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily categorize this as giving up so much as a... A, a milestone that God brought into my life was God showed me that I need to spend the first hour of the day with the Lord in a very serious way. Um, that was probably the most foundational milestone that I ever, uh, you know, took place in my life was the decision to spend the first hour of the day with God. It's interesting. I've been doing that for over 20 years and I'm convinced that anything that has come out of my life pretty much goes back to that. And I had a group of people in my house just uh, a month or two ago, and I was going over my conviction that we, we must spend the first hour of the day with the Lord. And um, as soon as I was finished, someone uh, had a lengthy discussion on why that's not necessary. And I know that there's a lot of people that, that argue with that and they don't think that it's necessary. There's nothing more holy about the morning than the evening. All I know is you start reading through the biographies of the, of the heroes of the faith and pretty much 100% of them will agree with that. I know people work night shifts and you know that there's differences there with all of that. But I would say if anybody's going to be successful, you have to spend at least an hour with the Lord every day in the morning. I love that idea, and I did that in my youth. Then I got married, then I had children, then I went to school. I, I often end up beating myself over the head more often than not because <laughs> there are times where if I get 15 minutes, I count myself the luckiest man in the world. How, how do you, I mean, I've often thought I feel bookended, you know, my, my daughter won't go to bed uh, right now couple weeks. I'm lucky if I get to bed by 1130. And I'm also working full time. It's just like, I feel like I have to sleep. But uh, anyway, I like to hear a bit more. Like I said, it sounds great. But I almost I almost feel like I got to be a grandpa before I, I get back to my my usual routine. Uh, can you put that in more shoe leather for me? Well, brother, it sounds like you're in the wine press. <laughs> I'm not saying that to be funny, but um, no, honestly, life does bring a lot of challenges. It really does. I would say one thing you could consider is sitting down and just honestly evaluating what you have going and figuring out strategically, you know, is there some way I can schedule this? Um, you know, is there a way that I can make a schedule and try to stick with it? That's what um, comes to my mind. There are different times and seasons in life, and I'm not here to send anyone on a guilt trip or to put pressure on people, but I, I know that these are principles that the heroes of the faith have, have uh, promoted. So maybe someone else has a good answer. I think there are many facets to this discussion. I think one of them is that legalism can also be a curse. And uh, I had to come to the place in my life somewhere along the way that I realized if I missed a quiet time or didn't have my Bible reading in the morning or didn't have a time of prayer, it's still okay. And so how much of these are our own expectations? But I, I don't discount the fact that all the great men of the Bible and women too were early risers and they did consistently spend time with God. So sometimes we just need to step back and say, you know, God knows we're human. He knows our limits. Amen. I guess I wanted to share something similar. I, I appreciate that concept and I have tried to follow it at different times in my life when I was able to order my life. Um, and I don't mean that um, casually, 
There have been times in life when there is no way to order it. Um, for many years I lived out of a backpack with three changes of clothes and never knew where I was going to be that night. And that, that type of life, you really can't order it. Um, but the thing that has gradually grown in my life is like a continual sense of presence of being with God. And, you know, through chronic pain or whatever other issue I'm dealing with, if I'm awake at night, I can be with him. And I can be praying, I can be thinking, I can be meditating. Um, if it's travel, if it's other issues where there's no way to have that quiet time, but in my mind, there's a space to be with him. And it's, I don't mean this as like a super spiritual type thing, but as a reality, as just a, a living presence type of thing. And for some of us, when we can't order our lives that way um, for seasons, um, there, is, there is a way to, to experience that. I have a question around the idea of um, not like self-inflicting suffering, but you know the scripture says that if we humble ourselves, um, we'll be exalted. So God can humble us. We can also humble ourselves. Do we have to go through suffering that God brings to our lives if we can somehow through fasting and not self-inflicting suffering, but some type of self-humbling suffering or self-denial. I'm not sure how to word what I'm trying to say. Yeah, certainly. I think there is a certain measure of <clears throat> humbling ourselves under the Lord through fasting and things like that. I think we need to be careful that we don't get the idea that if I fast enough, then I won't have to go through persecution or, you know, something like that. Uh, the Apostle Paul went through an awful lot of, how would I say, persecution and outward trials and so on. And I'm sure that he was, at the same time, doing all the fasting and all that that he was supposed to. But I, I guess what I really feel is, if I humble myself, then when those outward trials come, we get further ahead. In other words, there have been people who have resisted God or have been lukewarm, and the Lord brings outward trials, and, and oh yes, they humble themselves, and, but sometimes the progress is minimal. Whereas other people, it's like they're humbling themselves, they're seeking the Lord, and there's a, there's a platform, and whenever there's an outward trial comes, it's like the whole thing just launches them way forward, and there's much more fruitfulness comes out of it. I guess that's what would come to my mind. <clears throat> well, thank you, Elisha. And yeah, Christians, go forth and die. I think that's the call. It's a very serious call. So let's devote our life to that finding our way through death to resurrection life.